and welcome to our special program to the point today we have with us a special guest an academician and a historian and a politician all in one a member of Trinamool Congress and a member of Parliament from the party from West Bengal's Chadapur constituency, Mr. Shogata Bose. So, welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. Uh, let's begin with a topic uh, which has been uh, at the centre of, uh, you know, I must say controversy as well as uh, uh, public debate, debate both uh, inside the house and outside the house as well. And uh, you've, you've also expressed your views inside the house on that particular topic, the topic of uh, the issue of uh, nationalism. There are, uh, you know, uh, several aspects of uh, this particular issue which has been put forth by different political parties depending upon their ideologies, depending upon their own uh, interpretation. What is it that your views are uh, as an academician and as an historian as well? Well, as I pointed out in uh, a recent speech in Parliament, uh, nationalism is a truly Janus faced phenomenon. It has its liberating aspect. It can have an oppressive aspect. And I favor uh, the kind of nationalism which instills a spirit of service among our people uh, and also inspires their creative efforts. Uh, that is how uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose uh, defined what is good about nationalism ever since the 1920s. And nationalism, uh, in its oppressive aspect uh, has also been seen in many different uh, parts of the world, uh, such as uh, Germany in the 1930s. And when Shubhash Chandra Bose left Germany in 1936 uh, after a three-year exile in Europe, he was in many different countries of Europe, but he described German nationalism of that time as narrow, selfish and arrogant. And he also did not like the kind of nationalism which expressed itself in the form of imperialism against other countries. Mm -hmm. He opposed what he called self-aggrandizement. Mm -hmm. And that is why I think uh, it is extremely important for us to nurture a love for our uh, homeland, mm -hmm. uh, but also understand that a genuine nationalism will respect citizens' rights, especially their rights of free expression. In particular, I had cited in my speech yeah. a book or a series of lectures given by Rabindranath Tagore exactly 100 years ago. Uh, he traveled from India by sea, first to Japan, and then he crossed the Pacific Ocean uh, to the United States of America. And there he traveled from uh, the west coast to the east coast, delivering his critique of nationalism. Mm -hmm. Because as he saw it during the First World War, nationalism in Europe had led to a carnage, you know, in the battlefields of Europe. Uh -huh. So I think we should be all aware of the positive as well as the negative aspects of nationalism. It can be a boon and a curse, and we should adopt that kind of nationalism, which is a boon for our country. You mentioned Rabindranath Tagore and you mentioned him in the uh, speech as well, uh, which you made in the lower house uh, on this issue. Uh, and saying that uh, Rabindranath Tagore was a critique of uh, nationalism. But that was around uh, the time when uh, India was uh, fighting the colonial powers for independence. Uh, uh, Time has changed a lot. Don't you think the values would have also undergone, uh, undergone a change and the perception of nationalism should also change with the changing times? Of course, times have changed. But uh, I think it's a mistake to think that uh, Tagore was critical of nationalism uh, in the period of the anti-colonial struggle. Mm -hmm. The point is that Rabindranath Tagore never gave up his anti-colonial stance. Mm -hmm. He was opposed to British rule in India. Mm -hmm. And in that way, he was a nationalist. Mm -hmm. In fact, when he died in 1941, mm -hmm. Mahatma Gandhi, in his obituary reference, uh, described Rabindranath Tagore as a nationalist. So what was Rabindranath Tagore all about? Uh, when the Swadeshi movement started in 1905, mm -hmm. he wrote beautiful patriotic songs. Mm -hmm. These were odes to the motherland. So he loved his own country. 
But what was the point that he was making? He was asking Indian patriots mm -hmm. not to imitate the monstrous features of Western nationalism, mm -hmm. because that was a nationalism that led to war and conflict and denial of rights to citizens. Mm -hmm. So let us not confuse Tagore's anti-colonialism mm -hmm. uh, uh, with uh, his, you know, some critical views on nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, he was just asking uh, his own countrymen to be generous and enlightened nationalists. And as you know, uh, he is the author of not only the national anthem of our own country, India, mm -hmm. but one of his songs written in the Swadeshi era was adopted by Bangladesh as its national anthem, Amashonar Bangla. So he was definitely someone who was a patriot. He loved his own region, Bengal. He loved his own country, India or Bharatvarsha. But he said, our nationalism should not be the kind of nationalism that leads to conflict, war, denial of rights of citizens. Uh, so, you know, let's have a sophisticated view of nationalism. Uh, you just uh, said that uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, when he was uh, traveling through Europe uh, during those times, and uh, he was in Germany as well, and he termed uh, the, you know, the German nationalism as, uh, you said, narrow, shellfish, and arrogant. So, is that how you look at the definition of nationalism being uh, propagated now? Is that are you seeking to make a comparison the same in the similar way as uh, Subhash Chandra Bose was talking about the German nationalism then? There is no exact analogy mm -hmm. between Germany in the 1930s and what is going on in India or anywhere else in the world mm -hmm. today, but we can always learn a few lessons from history. And so far as the words are concerned uh, that Shubhash Chandra Bose used, that what he saw of German nationalism in the 1930s, he found narrow, selfish, and arrogant. I think that some of the definitions of nationalism that are coming from ruling circles in our country today uh, can be described with those same words, narrow, selfish, and arrogant. And I mentioned that in Parliament because I want everyone in our country to give up the narrow definitions of nationalism and adopt much more generous, capacious, enlightened versions of nationalism. You said generous, capacious and enlightened version of nationalism. Can you uh, define it a little bit further as you uh, you know, as to, as to how do you uh, differentiate between uh, the kind of uh, nationalism which is being talked about right now and the kind of nationalism which you're talking about uh, should be uh, focused on? Okay, uh, I think our nationalism should be generous in at least two different senses. Mm -hmm. One is that, you know, our country is very diverse and therefore we have to consider what kind of a union of India uh, will genuinely be a strong union of India. And if you look at our most enlightened anti-colonial leaders, uh, I mentioned Aurobindo, for example, uh, in the course of my parliamentary speech. They had always said that in India, we should always have a federal unity. You have to allow, let us say, Tamils to be very fond of their own region, Tamil Nadu, mm -hmm. or Punjabis of Punjab, mm -hmm. uh, Maharashtrians uh, so of Western identities. India. So I don't think people need to give up their regional identities. Mm -hmm. They don't even have to give up their religious identities. We have many languages, many religions. I mentioned uh, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I described uh, the Ramayana as holding up as an ideal, a kind of a dharma rajya, mm -hmm. which was not a centralized despotism. Mm -hmm. I talked about the Mahabharata. Uh, there too, uh, you know, there was a conception of what in modern terms can be called a federal unity for the whole of India. Mm -hmm. So at one level, our nationalism has to be generous in order to accommodate the multiple identities of our people. And in another sense, our nationalism should also be very generous. And that is 
uh, we must also think about humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, that our nationalism should also be universalist mm -hmm. or internationalist. Mm -hmm. We should always think of what is the contribution that India can make to the rest of the world. Uh, again, as Tagore has said, that we should not be constrained by narrow walls. Mm -hmm. We ought not to build these narrow walls around our country. We have to con constantly have conversations with peoples outside of our borders. So in these two very uh, specific ways, uh, multiple identities, regions coming together to form a union of India, and then an India uh, which is comfortable in a larger global setting. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm uh, thinking of when I talk about a generous conception of nationalism. Okay, great. Uh, we will continue this conversation with uh, Shukata Bose, but we will uh, take a short break here. And when we come back, we'll also talk about uh, what exactly uh, he believes or he thinks about uh, uh, the controversy surrounding his great-grandfather -grand Shubhash Chandra Bose as well, and his life and works, how those could influence this entire debate about nationalism. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The Trinamool Congress MP, the academician, the historian and the politician Shogatha Bose is still with us. Uh, so continuing the conversation, um, let me ask you something out here. Given the global anxiety about national security, you know, we've seen uh, terrorism being a very uh, important issue uh, worldwide and in our country as well. How prudent do you think uh, could be the idea of overlooking the anti-national uh, sentiments, the anti-national slogans, which uh, were uh, had considered to be at the heart of this entire controversy when it was said that, you know, there, are, there were allegedly anti-national uh, anti slogans which were uh, raised in the GNU and then uh, the person concerned, that's the Kanaya Kumar, was, uh, you know, the GNU president, Students' Union president, was arrested and then later uh, given bail. So, do you think it's, it's, it's prudent enough to overlook uh, such incidents if they happen in uh, our universities, our colleges, or in student politics? I'm not saying that we have to uh, overlook them. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, uh, I think we have to ask ourselves a couple of questions. That uh, are we self-confident or not? Do we genuinely believe that the union of India is intrinsically strong. I do. I think also that the idea of India is greater than the Indian state mm -hmm. at any particular moment in time. So why should we overreact if there are a handful of people who raise some troubling slogans? And so far as the specific question of uh, Kanhaya Kumar is concerned, uh, it is very clear from the evidence that, you know, he himself does not appear uh, mm -hmm. to have raised slogans which could but in any way be determined anti-national. Uh, anti mm -hmm. So I think overreaction is not the answer. Okay. Uh, and uh, it is also a question of sensible governance. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to have uh, autonomy in our universities and we should uh, always try to diffuse tension. Uh, we should never escalate a crisis. I felt that this was a problem that could have been resolved within the university, which got blown out of all proportion uh, into a national and an, even an international issue. People are talking about it all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I do believe in uh, freeing our universities, giving the freedom uh, to our students to speak, uh, to criticize, and as I said in my speech in Parliament, even the freedom to make mistakes and to learn from them. Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's what I was going through. Uh, similar incidents after that were reported from uh, the Jadapur University as well in your state. And uh, on this issue, if I may say, uh, both you, your party, and your arch rivals in the state, political arch rivals in the state, uh, the left front, the you know, the parties which uh, make the left front combinedly. 
they seem to be on the, on on a similar page on 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 the same platform if you look at uh, the viewpoint wise so is it uh, not something uh, which uh, seems to not gel with the political ideology of uh, trinmul congress in terms of uh, you know their rivals vis a vis the left front no i think uh, it was exactly a case of sensible governance mm -hmm. that uh, you don't want to make things worse uh, and that's why I think the uh, state administration and also the university administration took a very wise decision uh, not to overreact to a few slogans which may have been raised in the streets around the campus of Jadavpur University. And I'm glad to say that more or less all uh, mainstream parties were on the same page uh, last month. And I think that is exactly right. Uh, you know, all political parties and also governments, I might add, uh, should really respect the autonomy of uh, universities and okay. university life. Uh, let me also uh, bring in one more related question out here. In fact, I read uh, one of your interviews where, uh, in response to a question, you had said that uh, uh, you're not exactly, uh, you know, anti-left. There are there are there are certain, uh, you know, leaders out there. Uh, maybe the past ones and certain ideologies which you believe uh, were uh, in the, in the right place. Uh, so so, uh, why and how these left leanings, being an anti-left party and a member of parliament from uh, Trinmul Congress, uh, uh, a party which rooted left out of West Bengal after 34 uh, years of uh, continuous power? You know, it all depends on how you uh, define leftism. Uh, I am, I think, uh, rather. Uh, old-fashioned uh, social democrat, uh, uh, but uh, somebody who uh, takes uh, his ideas about uh, equality mm -hmm. or Samyavad uh, from India's past. Uh, even the term Samyavad, equality, mm -hmm. uh, goes back to Buddhist times uh, in India. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that uh, in the late 1920s mm -hmm. and during the entire decade of the 1930s, Jawaharlal Nehru mm -hmm. and Shubhash Chandra Bose were described as leftists. Mm -hmm. They represented the leftist tendency within the Indian National Indian Congress. Indian Congress. That is because they stood for a more radical nationalism, but also because they believed that there has to be a blueprint for a social and economic reconstruction of our country once freedom was won. And in that period of reconstruction, we must actually uh, be on the side of the peasants, uh, of the workers, uh, those who are downtrodden in terms of uh, caste or gender. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely stand uh, for the rights of our working classes, uh, of various uh, people who were left marginalized because of caste and I stand for equal rights for women. So that's why, uh, you know, uh, I don't think that this uh, left-right divide uh, is relevant uh, in, uh, you know, such contexts. Okay. Talking about uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, you just mentioned him, your uh, great grandfather. Uh, I have a few questions. Let's begin with uh, your opposition to the suggestions which were made about uh, uh, awarding Bharat Zatna to uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. Why so? Why did you oppose this move? I believe that uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose uh, stand way above the level of the Bharat Ratna. Uh, that is an award which has been given to nearly what, 43 people mm -hmm. sort of now. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if he had been given it uh, alongside Jawaharlal Nehru in the 1950s, it might have made some sense. Mm -hmm. But there are some great people uh, of the early 20th century who have been kept above the Bharat Ratna. Uh, I've mentioned Gandhi ji and Netaji, but also Rabindranath Tagore. So mm -hmm. his stature is so high mm -hmm. that it, in fact it would be uh, demeaning him if he were to be uh, given such an award of Bharat Ratna. His, the prize that he got was the love of the people of his country for the huge sacrifices 
that he made for India's freedom. Okay, we have uh, in the recent past, in the uh, you know uh, since the time uh, NDA has come to power, we've seen this uh, tussle between both uh, national parties uh, about uh, you know uh, sort of attaching themselves uh, to the national icons, uh, national leaders. Uh, um, be it Mahatma Gandhi, be it uh, Dr. Bhim Rama Medkar, or even uh, your great grandfather Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, and uh, both of them accuse each other of uh, appropriation of legacies. You're a member of the family. What are your views on it? Uh, he was a member of Nas Indian National Congress as well. He went away. Uh, he formed his own, uh, uh, you know, unit. He formed uh, the INA and fought for the freedom. Uh, separately, so it, is this uh, something? Uh, is this is this something which disturbs you uh, as as a member of the family, as as a descendant of that great leader? First of all, uh, uh, family membership counts for nothing when Netaji is being uh, talked about. His family was not so small. He always said that his family and his country were uh, coterminous. And when I speak about Netaji, I always want to speak uh, as a historian and also as an Indian, mm -hmm. because every Indian was a member mm -hmm. uh, of his family. From that perspective, uh, I do sometimes worry when I find uh, Netaji being appropriated uh, or attempted to be appropriated uh, by various political parties who have not actually studied what Netaji really stood for. Mm -hmm. And uh, into my mind, uh, Netaji's greatest achievement uh, was the way in which he united Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, members of all religious communities in a common struggle for freedom. Uh, and therefore, anybody who wishes to honor Netaji must, in fact, also believe uh, in equal rights for all the religious communities of India. In one of my parliamentary speeches uh, last year, I pointed out that, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned that he was actually my grand uncle. My grand father uncle. was Shishir Kumar Bose, yeah. who drove Netaji during the escape from Calcutta yeah. in January of 1941. And I pointed out that when he reached Peshawar, the man who received him was Mia Akbar Shah, a freedom fighter from the Northwest Frontier Province. Later, when he traveled by submarine for three months from Europe to Asia in 1943, his only Indian companion was Abid Hassan, a Muslim from Hyderabad, Deccan. When he raised the Azad Hind Forge, his first division, which fought in Imphal and Kohima, was commanded by Muhammad Zaman Kiani. On his last final flight, uh, when he died as a consequence of the tragic crash, his only Indian companion was a man called Habibur Rahman. And when three of his INA officers were put on trial by the British at the Red Fort in November 1945, they were Shanawas Khan, a Muslim, Prem Kumar Saigal, a Hindu, and Gurbak Singh Dhilan, a Sikh. And uh, there was a slogan that was raised in those days, which was uh, Lal Kile Se Ay Awaz, Sagal uh, Dhilan Shanawaz. You know, that is the kind of spirit of unity that we have to rekindle in our country uh, today. And if there are those who don't believe in Netaji's ideology in that respect, have no right to be claiming Netaji, Shuhash Chandra Bose. And he was also committed uh, to the working classes, the peasants and the workers, the depressed classes, as they were called before independence, these are scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and women. He said these three communities were neglected, they have to be empowered. So anybody saying that we want to follow Netaji's ideals should in fact uh, be doing all of these things that were so dear to Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. Okay, one last quick question before we uh, bring this conversation to an end. Uh, the controversy surrounding Bose files. Uh, 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 an uh, attempt was made by uh, the Trinamool Congress uh, Chief and West Bengal uh, Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee uh, by putting some files in public domain. Then the same was done by the central government led by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, do you believe that uh, more needs to be done in terms of uh, you know unearthing uh, this this entire uh, 
you know, uh, this, uh, this, is a, this entire uh, controversy which has been resolving rather this entire controversy which has been surrounding around uh, Netaji's death. Uh, while you have written a book and you've uh, said it right now that, uh, you know, he uh, passed away in that uh, tragic crash. There are other theories as well. So do you believe that the government should go ahead and do a little more, get in touch with other governments, uh, other nations, uh, get those documents, make it public, settle this controversy once and for all? Well, I believe that all historical files should be opened. Uh, and uh, the West Bengal government did the right thing by opening all files that were in their possession. And uh, the government of India also should have opened all of these files together. Uh, I don't like this uh, policy uh, of opening a Phase few wise. files uh, every mo month. They these are a small number of files which are still closed and can be, you know, thrown open tomorrow if the government uh, so wishes. Most countries in the world, certainly the de democratic countries, have thrown open all their files. So I believe uh, in uh, having a proper archives policy uh, and I do believe in freedom of information. But there was enough evidence th uh, on the basis of which I could come to a conclusion about the mortal end of a deathless hero. My book was about Netaji Shubhashchandra Bose's life. I put the focus back on his life and his achievements and I had to, of course, deal with the question of his death in a final chapter, which I did, and there was sufficient evidence on which I could come to a conclusion on that matter. Netaji lives in a much deeper sense, in our hearts, in terms of the legacy that he has left us. I will only tell the younger generation in our country that there is so much to learn from Netaji's book of life. Always remember that the life was more fascinating and continues to be more important than the legend. Thank you so much, sir. So this was uh, the academician, the historian, and a politician, Shugatha Boss, in a conversation with us. Stay tuned. We'll come back next week with a different guest on a different topic.